Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those online. Uh, we're having what's called a technical hitch at the moment. Um, I'm sure normal service will be revealed uh, in a few minutes. Uh, While we're waiting, though, there's just a few things we can go through. Uh, welcome to those who are joining in person. Great to see you here. Great to see some visitors. We trust that uh, you'll be blessed with us this morning as we meet and worship together. Uh, <coughs> we are uh, celebrating communion at the end of the service. Uh, and uh, we need to get some volunteers sorted for helping to distribute it. So we've already got Julie, we've got Debbie, and I need two others to volunteer. Yep, so I've got Roger and I've got Phil. Okay, so thank you very much, those. If you can come up when Joshua says, and uh, uh, we can help distribute the, the bread and wine, then we take that together at the end. Uh, so it's going to be a great service this morning because this is, of course, uh, the third Sunday in Advent. Okay, and that means that there's only one more Sunday to go, uh, and then it'll be Christmas before the next Sunday, so that's great. So we love to be celebrating together the fact that Jesus is coming into the world, and we've got a fantastic uh, passage uh, to, uh, that Josh is going to preach on about the second half of Lazarus. Can you guess what happens? Yes! It's great, so it's going to be a great service this morning. So, uh, I mentioned it's Advent, so it's traditional that we actually light some candles, but unfortunately, because of the COVID regs, it's going to be me that lights them. Oh. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, so, I'm just going to go and light some candles. Now, as uh, I think it was Paul said last time, maybe it was, uh, uh, maybe it was Joshua, uh, this time we remember not only Christ coming for the first time, but we also sometimes uh, get our thoughts on him coming again. Uh, it seems like a long wait, seemed particularly this year with all that's going on in COVID, we could really do with the Lord coming again, but he'll come in his own good time and he will come, and that's what these candles help to remind us of. Now, it looks like we might be back up and running on the tech side. Yeah. Are we? I have to use the button to pop with my own finger. Mm, okay, we'll see what we can do. Might be tricky during the, uh, uh, during the notices. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, let's take it from the top yeah, let's and do the that again. again. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Do you know this one?
So my name is Wilson Rosander. I'm one of the leaders here at the chapel. And it's a pleasure to lead this service this morning. It's great to see you all here. If you are watching online, welcome as well. I'm afraid I don't have my uh, phone to speak to, so I'm going to be searching for it, which I'm sure will be fun. And in case you were wondering, are there some seats that Mr. Brown did manage to come up behind? Yeah. Well, so far, the answer is yes. Right. Uh, so, uh, so there are, are uh, other spaces here, so if you would like to come up the hill next week, then maybe there's room for you. We just pray that uh, we will never actually overflow, uh, which of course is, uh, is a risk. Uh, but it's great to see everyone here this morning in person, and I'm really pleased that uh, you know, those restrictions have been, uh, been relaxed and we're able to gather. Uh, there is plenty of activities going on in the week, actually, uh, some of them in the virtual world of Zoom, some of them uh, actually in the real world. Uh, and tonight, there's a, a special thing in the real world. Our friends down at the Royston Evangelical Church, who are meeting in the Coombe Centre now because they've, uh, they've grown so big, uh, they have a, a special evening service, which is in lieu of their normal Bible Society meeting that they normally have in October. Uh, but of course, that couldn't happen. So they've got that uh, this evening. Uh, and many of you will know uh, the people who are taking the service. That's Andrew and Anya Cannon. Uh, they used to be members here. Uh, they went off to uh, London City Mission, uh, where Anya is still working there, and they'll be speaking a bit about London City Mission uh, this evening. So if you want to go there, that's, I think, 6.50, yes, at the Coombe Centre this evening. Okay, yes, symbol, yes, that's it. we we'll maybe do that after everyone. Uh, so the next one, uh, ready with your symbol, is the prayer meeting. That's right. Uh, to, so tomorrow evening, we're back on Zoom for our prayer meeting at 7.30. Lots of opportunities to pray together, which is great, especially at this time, but I guess at any time. So 7.30 on Zoom. Then the Tuesday afternoon group uh, is meeting at 2 o'clock, and according to there, it's the prayer meeting. And according to Paul, who's the oracle of this, it's the prayer meeting as well. Uh, 2 p.m. at Zoom. And then we have our ladies' prayer meeting, uh, which I think is a prayer meeting, not a Bible study. Uh, can't attract Ashley's attention. Uh, it's uh, up here at uh, 10 o'clock on uh, Wednesday morning if you're a lady. Okay. Then uh, Thursday, uh, we continue in the series of The Chosen. The Chosen is uh, a video uh, series that's being produced. I say being because it's not finished yet. Uh, and uh, it's really pretty good. It's got a very low cringe factor. If you're used to seeing some Christian productions, you'll know what I mean there. Uh, but this is a very, very low cringe factor production of the Gospels. If you haven't seen them already, they're available on YouTube, uh, so you can catch up there if you can put up the adverts, or you can come up here and see it advert-free. How about that? Yes. Uh, then uh, on Saturday, that's next Saturday, uh, the 19th, on the green there, uh, just in front of the pub, uh, we've got a uh, carol singing. So uh, some of the band, I don't know how many, uh, maybe maybe more of the band, I don't know, are uh, on the heath, or on, not on the heath, on the, uh, on the green there, uh, leading, uh, leading us in a carol service. Uh, it will be open air, of course, so, you know, weather could have something to say about that, but uh, we must pray that it will be uh, at least dry. Uh, and we're all invited up there for that. Socially distanced, of course, uh, hopefully lots of people from the village as well, uh, and the pub will be open serving scotch eggs and drinks, I think. Okay. Sorry? Substantial Scotch eggs, that's right, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, indeed. And then Sunday, next Sunday, is, uh, the, is our uh, Advent service, so there'll be a special Christmas message there from Joshua in the morning, uh, rather than continuing with, uh, with our series in, in John. Uh, and then Christmas, uh, as I like to say, is the 25th this year, that's uh, two, one week on Friday, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so we'll be having our service at 11 o'clock uh, up here at the chapel. A little bit shorter than the normal services, uh, and we'll have to be socially distanced and all the rest as well. Uh, but it'll be great to be able to join together to worship the Lord in the day that we celebrate uh, his coming to us as the Lord Jesus as a baby. Okay, uh, there's no service on the 27th of December, but we resume again on the 3rd of January with our series in John. Okay. Uh, now, what have I forgotten to do? I've given out the rec and candles, got service for communion. I think we're all sorted, unless anyone has got any other notices that I've forgotten. No. In which case, let's just, uh, let's just come before the Lord briefly in prayer. 
Father, we do thank you that uh, we have the technology uh, to speak to people on Facebook, that we have the technology over the, the lockdowns to continue meeting virtually, and that we have the freedom at the moment to, to come and to gather and to meet. And we just pray that you would bless us wherever we're meeting this morning and bless all who are involved with this, uh, with, with this service. In Jesus' name, amen. For your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence for me. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all.
Do be seated and let's now join uh, before the Lord as we come to, to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, we've just been singing about uh, the Trinity and it's an amazing time of year as we remember the incarnation of 
one of the Trinity, of the Son, of you, Lord Jesus, coming into this world as a baby. What a, an unfathomable concept that is, something which theologians try and fail to understand, and yet which all can believe in simple faith that you are truly God and truly man, that you entered our world to care for us and more than that, to redeem us. Forgive us when we sideline you, when we ignore you, when we do our own thing and go our own way and live as though this life is all there is and live as though what we hear in the media is all the truth that there is. Help us to see past these things and help us to worship you and help us to keep you at our centre and help the church to present this message of hope, this message of light, this message of joy to the world this Christmas time. We pray that both us as individuals and us as your church here in Fairfield and your church as your body in this world would be able to take advantage of this time to present the truth that is there, that marvellous, that great, that redeeming truth that God is with us, that God has become a man. What a thought. What a message to deliver to people today. And we pray that we would find effective ways of sharing our faith. Help us as we care for one another in this church and in our communities to, to find ways to, uh, to support and to help <clears throat> to help those uh, who are around us who are struggling at this time, to find ways that are safe of encouraging and helping and having fellowship with people. We thank you again that we can meet physically and pray that in doing so that we would not spread the virus. We pray that you be with those who are shielding and vulnerable and otherwise unable or are unwilling to come to join us physically in person. We pray that they would know your presence with them wherever they are today or whenever they're, they're hearing this service. We pray, Father, that you would help us all to indeed have our hope set in you, to our, have our trust in you, and to remember that the Lord Jesus who came 2,000 years ago as a baby will come once more as King and as Lord to wind up this, this history and to bring us to glory who have faith in you. Lord, this is such a, a big message and such an important thing. And yet there are other things going on in our lives and in our countries that we would bring to you as well, which will have a bearing in our lives over years to come. And once more we come bring to you our requests for Brexit and for all that will go on there. As the negotiations come to what must soon be a conclusion, we pray, Father, that there would be a fair settlement for both sides. We pray that the politicians would not be trying to score points over each other or to, to win, uh, but we'd be seeking something which is fair and equitable, something which protects the vulnerable on both sides, Lord, in Europe and, uh, and in the UK. And we pray for wisdom and responsibility for those leaders as they conclude the negotiations, that they would not be beset by pride or personal prestige or wondering about their own place in history, but would be caring for people, Lord. And we pray that uh, you would help your church to be able to demonstrate that care, whatever the settlement is, whatever the arrangements are. And we thank you once more that uh, the one that we can truly trust is you that we can if we depend in our governments if we depend in our military if we depend in our economy if we depend in our science or our health service or even our technology in this service if we depend on those things they will fail us but you will never fail us and we thank you and we worship you for that this morning and we pray now that uh, you would bless us as we hear your word and we pray that you would bless joshua as he speaks to us and we pray that you would speak through him lord that we would hear uh, uh, hear your voice speaking to us and that we would be encouraged and challenged in our faith and in our lives by your word. Amen. Good morning, guys. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, the reading today is from John 11, verse 27 to verse... 57. Here we go. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. Teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. 
When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus... Good morning, guys. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, the reading today is from John 11, verse 27 to verse 57. Here we go. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, called Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
there was two different reactions from the sister. Last week, we looked at the first sister, and her name was Martha. And she ran out, and she was very frustrated. Jesus, why didn't you get here earlier? If you had got here earlier, you know, we know you're a godly man, that when you pray, that uh, God hears you. And, and if you had got here on time, well, you know, my brother might still be alive. However, and then, but she says this great word of faith. However, I know that even now, I know that even now, whatever you ask for, God will give you. And Jesus gives her this great revelation. It, you know, the, the, um, the resurrection is just not something that's going to happen in the future. One day, way out there, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, and it was, it's just this fantastic theological revelation uh, that Jesus had really not given to anybody else. But he'd given to, here he is given to his friend Martha. Just the two of them having this conversation. It's one of the most powerful statements in all of John's gospel. And he doesn't give it to a multitude. He doesn't give it to his 12 disciples. Uh, he gives it to his friend Martha. Uh, and that's where we left last week. This week, we're looking at the other sister. We're looking at Mary. So in, uh, in verse 20, it says, having said this, in other words, Jesus had been talking to Martha outside their village. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. I like that. I like that. Martha refers to her friend Jesus as the teacher. You know, Jesus was king, Jesus was rabbi, he was, he was also a teacher. And she comes back, she sees her sister. Now, think of all the things Martha could have said for just a second. Think about the great revelation she just had. Think about the great insight that Jesus just gave her. She could have ran back home and been like, Mary, boy, did you ever miss it. <laughs> Mary, you were just sitting here weeping and, and having, you know, your little pity party and being all miserable. In the meantime, I was out there with Jesus, and he was downloading some, like, class A theology to me, and you were just missing it. Now, she could have said something like that. She, she could have made Martha or Mary, Martha could have made Mary kind of feel bad for not going out with her to meet Jesus originally. She could have given her a hard time about that, and yet she didn't. She just kind of lovingly says, hey, the teacher's calling for you. Doesn't give any hint what he might say. Doesn't make her feel bad for not having gone out earlier. She said, the teacher's calling for you. It's interesting seeing these three, and we're going to see more of them in chapter 12. These three siblings are very different. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, they're different personality. They kind of see the world through. How many of you have siblings like this? Maybe you have a brother. Maybe you have a sister. And it's not, it's not that you don't love each other. You, you may love your sister or your brother very much. But when you sit down and you talk, you realize you just see the world completely differently. You may belong, have different set of politics. You may have different views on, on social ideas. You, you may go to very, if you're both Christians, you may even go to very different churches. Some of you may go to uh, more free, expressive churches and somebody else a more contemplative, inward, reserved sort of church. And, and it, it's like you're, it's like, how did we have the same parents? It's like, see, you see, you think sometimes you come from a different planet to your, your siblings sometimes. I have, we have four children. Um, yes, that's a lot. <laughs> we have four children, and they are all very different. Uh, Ransom, Naomi, Elijah, Anya. It's like my wife and I look at each other sometimes like, how did this happen? <laughs> how, how, how is it not a, just that we are not how we four kids. I know how we have four kids. That's a, but how are they all so different from one? It's like there's no two of them that are anywhere like each other. They're all very unique. And you see this with these three. Why is this interesting? Because it's not just their personalities that are different, but their way of connecting with Jesus and talking with Jesus is really different. Uh, one of the things that a lot of time the, the New Testament apostles, they, they take time to do is when they write to churches to talk about giving each other freedom in what the New Testament calls disputable matters or matters of conscience. So they say like, for example, some of you adhere to Jewish laws and you, know, you believe you should only eat certain things or that you should observe uh, certain holidays or you should do this while others of you feel very free. Not to obey those laws or not to uh, take on those observances. Give each other freedom. That's fine. Let, let each person follow their own conscience in these matters. What unites us is Jesus and that we connect with Jesus. Uh, 
And for otherwise of you, there's so many things that are just a matter of conscience. Some of you, you may have certain convictions about uh, the Sabbath and Saturday. You're not just, you're not going to work. On, on, I know people like this. You know, they th see Sunday as the Lord's Day where they go to church and Saturday is their Sabbath. They, they have particular views about these things. I know some Christians who don't celebrate holidays like Easter or Christmas because they don't see them in the Bible, but they'll celebrate Passover or different Old Testament holidays. They, that's a matter of their conscience. Okay, fine. <laughs> you want to do that? That's great. Do what's good. I'm not going to judge you as your brother and sister. Uh, different people have different views of, of spiritual gifts and how healing works or speaking in tongues. Um, fine. Welcome. If you love Jesus, that's what's important to us. Right? Now, we can talk about these other things, but we're not going to put each other down for matters of conscience. And I love how you see Lazarus and Martha and Mary very different in their expression and how they connect with Jesus, and yet they're siblings who love each other. And you see this in Martha's comment. She comes back in, and she doesn't say, well, you should have been like me and run out to see Jesus. She goes, hey, the teacher's looking for you. A very loving, kind word from one sister to another sister who's very different from her. And as soon as she heard this, she got up and quickly and went to him. And Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Mar Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. Okay, so uh, we heard the story from the reading, so I'm not going to go through it and necessarily read verse by verse. Uh, but we see what happens, that uh, Martha comes in and says, hey, the teacher's looking for you. She hears that and she's like, right, he's, he's asking for me? He mentioned my name? Well, okay, then. And so she gets up, she'd been crying, mourning for her brother, and she runs out to, to find Jesus, who's outside of the village. And the other people, the, these were sort of friends and relatives, connections of the family, uh, different people from Jerusalem, which was right nearby their village. Uh, they, they came and they've been mourning there, and they, they see Mary get up and run. They think, oh, maybe she's going to the tomb. She's going to the grave, and she's going to maybe weep there, and why don't we go with her so we can comfort her and, and be with her? And, and so they kind of, she runs out, and they kind of get up, and they begin to follow her, but instead of running to the tomb, she's actually running to Jesus. And so they follow her at a distance, but then they see that she's not at the tomb. She's, she actually goes to Jesus and says she, she falls down, and she says the same thing her sister said. Uh, and we looked at last week. She said, um, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Once again, going and just kind of expressing her frustration, expressing her grief. And we can do this, you know, especially as we talked about a lot last week. At the end of a year like this, a lot of us feel like we've lost things. We're, you know, whether that's socially, politically, relationally, uh, plans, hopes, money, financially. There's been all sorts of losses of various sorts that people feel that they have experienced this year. Part of this time of Advent, part of the, the reason we have Advent, traditionally, historically, throughout the history of the church, is we use this season as a time to lament, as a time to lament the losses from the year, but then to begin to look forward to the hope and the promise that Christ gives us in the life to come. So, and we saw that Martha did this very well. She came and fell at Jesus' feet and she kind of lamented the loss of her brother, but she expressed hope. But even now, God can do whatever you ask for. Mary's a bit different. She doesn't have that same hope that her sister Martha had. Martha seemed to grieve, but she was grieving with hope, whereas Mary just comes out and collapses and says, he'd still be alive if you weren't here. And then there's no follow-on expression of hope, no follow-on expression of faith, as if to say, yes, this is terrible, but... I know you can still work in a bad situation. For her, it's just grief. Jesus' reaction is very noticeable at this. It says, when the Lord saw her crying and the Jews who had come were also crying, he was angry in his spirit and deeply moved. Now, this word angry, it's not like mildly irritated. This is like a full-on robust word, Greek word for anger. This is furious this is upset this is this was this, it's not like when you know a lot of westerners or british people people fear especially from this part of the country you know i heard i heard one guy once say he goes oh i was so angry i almost said something 
You know, okay. He's, ex- he, he's talking about this situation where he was so intense and so worked up. He said, yes, I was in this situation and these people were saying these things and I was so furious on the inside. I almost said something about it. I was like, well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, the, this is a Middle Eastern Jewish guy. And so when it says he is furious, he is angry, it's not like, oh, maybe he almost, like, you can kind of picture him kicking rocks and, you know, just uh, really going to them. This is full on. And we don't think about Jesus very often like this. You know, a lot of our artwork and our paintings, uh, you know, and uh, everything, Jesus is very self-controlled, composed, put together, like nothing's going to bother him. And I think Jesus was probably mostly like that. Like, I think Jesus was a pretty composed guy but every now and then in scriptures in the gospel you get these glimpses where jesus just he's like berserk jesus this is like cage stage jesus where you know he sees something and the full human expression of his emotion just comes out and so he sees mary weeping the loss of her brother he sees the other jews weeping and he just gets angry now at first it's it's like well what, what's he so upset about what's he angry about well uh, and di- different people have maybe interpreted this a little differently. I think, based on what he says next, that he is angry. I think he's angry at death. I, th- I think that when he sees the grief that death has brought to Mary, his friend, and the way people are mourning, he's angry that the world is the way it is. He's angry that the world has fallen. He's angry that sin is in the world. And because sin is in the world, therefore death is in the world. He sees sort of the human condition with all its grief and all its loss and all its death and all its failure and all its sin and all its betrayal and all its injustice. And he, he, he just sees it all, how broken it is. And he's, he's angry. He's upset. He's deeply moved on the inside. And how is he expressing? I don't know. We don't get more details. Was he kicking rocks? Was he, I don't, I, was he pulling his hair? I don't know. But you can imagine him being very expressive. So that other people noticed that he was very angry. It's not like later he filled John in and said, yeah, back then you might not have noticed, but I was was pretty angry. So make sure when you're filling in your gospel, you make note of that. No, everyone saw and noticed that Jesus was full on angry. And what is, because what does he say? He says, where have you put him? And say, Lord, come and see. And then there's a, you want to learn a Bible verse? Here you go. If you haven't already learned this Bible verse, John chapter 11, verse 35 All of you can learn one verse if you haven't already. What is it? Jesus wept. That's right. It's uh, along with the Old Testament verse, Job replied. (laughs) One of the two shortest verses in the whole Bible. There you go. You can leave saying, I've memorized two verses, two whole Bible verses. Job replied and Jesus wept. There you go. Two verses. You memorize it. You're geniuses. Look at you. Jesus wept. He's going to the tomb of a friend. His friend Lazarus has died. Why why is he weeping? Well, in part, maybe he's weeping because Lazarus was his friend. And he's he's weeping over the death of his friend. Yes, but wider than that, he's seen the grief and loss and despair of all of those here. And death specifically with Lazarus, but also death generally throughout the human race. I think Jesus, he's going, and he's angry, and he's weeping. He's really, I mean, I think if he was here, if we could see, especially from sort of our Western, more reserved, North American slash British perspective, we think, this guy's lost it. Like, like, whoa, pull yourself together, man. It's like, really? Come on, hey, people die. It happens, you know, (laughs) relax. Jesus, for him, the enemy is sin and death. And he is fully expressing just how upset he is and how angry he is at the presence of sin and death in the creation that he made. He made mankind, uh, men and women, uh, to be good, to live together. When he created this world, it did not have sin. It did not have death. It did not have injustice. It, it did not have corruption. It had none of these things. And he's seen specifically with Lazarus, but generally the condition of the world. And, and he's, he's not being reserved in how he's expressing himself in any way. And you know what? There's time for us. A lot of times our idea of a good Christian is someone who's always polite, always composed, always got their stuff together. And there is some truth to that. I do think we should be self-controlled people. I don't think we should be people. We stub our toe and we go off the handles and we're just, we always give 
full vent to our anger. No, I think we should control our words. But there is a time when we see death and evil and we mourn it for what it is and we name it for what it is and we don't play games with it. There is a time to, yes, control our emotions. There are other times, though, to give proper expression to them. And Jesus, he feels under no obligation in this circumstance to act more composed or more pulled together than he needs to be. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And so the Jews are seeing how Jesus is reacting. Again, what was he doing physically? Was he pulling his hair? Was he kicking rocks? I don't know. But everyone is taking, like the Jews were pretty expressive. When someone died, they would weep and they would mourn. And yet Jesus is reacting even stronger than them. Because they're like, whoa, we're, we're mourning. But look at how Jesus is reacting. He must have really loved him. Because that's how they would interpret it. If you, you know, if someone died and you mourned a lot, it was an expression that, well, you must have really loved them. You missed them a lot. And so people would come to funerals to, to mourn, and they'd, they'd almost show off their mourning a little bit just to show how much they loved this person. And it, but Jesus reacted, wow, he must have really loved Lazarus because, you know, he, he's being very expressive. But some of them said, couldn't he, who had opened the blind man's eyes, also have kept this man from dying? And so they're saying, man, he must have really loved him. But someone else said, well, doesn't he have a bit of a healing ministry like if he had got here earlier couldn't he have prevented the death i mean if he loved him that much wouldn't he have got here quicker and so they're kind of discussing jesus's intense reaction and jesus's relationship to lazarus well it looks like he loves him but why didn't he get here sooner i don't know they're having this conversation among themselves then jesus angry again john again using a strong word here for being upset um you know, and he, he throws out this word again. He reminds us just how Jesus is still worked up. Jesus is still angry. Uh, then Jesus, angry in himself again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And what does Jesus say? Remove the stone. Now, if you've grown up in church, and maybe you've heard the story of Lazarus as a kid, it, we're a little bit numb to it because we've heard it so many times. But I just want to remind you what a radical thing that was to say in that moment. How outrageous that was. Let, let, let me give you an idea of how outrageous. Okay, it's like, we go to the, it's like we go to the graveyard out there, and I say, all right, guys, dig up the body. Dig up the coffin and break it open. It's like, uh, what? <laughs> uh, no. That's, and I don't know what was crazier, the fact that Jesus said it, or that some people were there, listened to Jesus, were like crazy enough to do it. <laughs> because some people listen to Jesus, because, you know, sister, she says, uh, Lord, that's not a good idea. This is the Middle East. I don't know if you know, it's been four days. And in the Middle East where it's hot and the sun is hot, his body is baking in there, decaying. It's going to stink just if you open. Maybe, maybe they thought Jesus just wanted to see the body. I don't know, but they said, just open it. This is a bad idea. And still there was some... There was somebody there that, you know, was crazy enough to hear Jesus and be like, listen, I'm listening to Jesus, and if he tells me to dig up the body and break open the coffin, and, well, you know, we're, we're going to do it. Um, and uh, so this is what happens. They, they listen. Uh, Jesus, he responds to Mary, he, or sorry, Jesus responds to Martha when she says he stinks. He says this, he goes, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Guys, if, if we can't have faith in ridiculous situations, we just can't have faith. If we only have faith when it makes sense and it's perfectly rational, and we're like, yeah, okay, I see how A connects with B and B connects with C, and okay, I, you know, I, I have a, a very reasonable faith. Well, first of all, I've said many times here, and I'll continue to say, faith is a very rational thing. There can be very good reasons for us to believe in the, you know, the order of the universe. We believe in the existence of God, and we study the life of Jesus, and we can believe very rationally he is who he says he was. And yet, sometimes practically, we will be in moments where we feel God is asking something of us. He's asking something of us in obedience, in response, and, and it, it, it's out, it feels outrageous in the moment. It seems outrageous in the moment. Yes, there's a rational side to faith, but trust me, you will be in moments where to obey Christ will require that you act and believe and respond in a way that seems absolutely nuts. And Jesus is saying to this 
Martha's saying, listen, don't dig up the body. That's, that's a bad idea. And he has to say, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. There are times in our life where our faith hits a crisis point, And we have to say, okay, I've said I believe. I've said I'm a Christian. I said I believe in God. I said I believe in Jesus. I believe in the resurrection. But there are times when it is put to the test. There are times when our faith is there and we have to decide, am I going to believe all this crazy stuff? <laughs> and, you know, or, or, or am, am I not? W which way am I going to go? And, and Jesus is calling Martha on and says, we, you've said you believe, right? We've had this conversation. I've told you I'm the resurrection and the life. And you nodded and said, yes, Jesus, you're the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, well, let's put this to the test then. Let's dig up the body. She's like, whoa, it's one thing for me to agree that you're the resurrection in life when it's just you and I having a nice conversation over coffee, Jesus. It's like, you know, we, we can agree theoretically. Yes, that's some great philosophy and theology you have there, Jesus. Oh, what a great sermon. Thank you. Yeah, that was lovely. But it's another thing that when you say, go and dig up the body. Wow, okay. That's when your faith gets tested. And you have moments like this. Now, I'm not saying we're going to literally dig up any bodies at the end of this sermon because that would be a bit weird. And uh, unless God opens up the heavens and sends an angel down here and tells us to do that, we're gonna, not going to be doing that anytime soon here at Therfield Chapel. Uh, but in this moment, this is how Jesus, this is how Mary's, uh, Martha's faith, rather, uh, was being tested. Didn't I tell you that if you believe you'd see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. I look forward to getting to heaven and find out who moved the stone. Like, I actually want to say, like, all right, because I'm sure most of the people thought it was a bad idea. I'm like, who was crazy enough to move the stone? And, you know, some guys can be like, ah, oh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was us. And I'd be like, I'm like, well done, because those are, that's the real hero of faith right there in this story, I think. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of this crowd standing here, I say this, so they may believe that you have sent me. Why did Jesus do miracles when he was on earth? Why? Anyone venture a guess? If you, can, if you have trouble speaking, you can lower it just for a second. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's a type of proof. Yeah. Yeah. He loved people. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, first, first, uh, you first. Sure, they came from the Father. Yeah, that's good. Demonstrate God's power. Anyone else? Glory to God. Okay, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> these, are all, these are all part of what he did. Um, we, we see in a few places where, you know, Jesus sometimes acted in like a spontaneous compassion. Like he was in a certain situation and he, he, it just says, and he was moved with compassion and he healed. So sometimes it was just, he saw something and in the moment he was moved with compassion and it was this a, a great expression of divine caring. Other times, uh, it was more like, I'm doing, like in this part, I'm doing this so that you can believe I came from the Father. There's a certain power to it. Um, other times, you know, it talks about these miracles, not just being miracles, but being signs. In other words, they weren't raw displays of power. Like Jesus just didn't go into Jerusalem and make a goat float through the air and be like, look at my neat Harry Potter tricks. Now, don't you see I have supernatural power? But all his miracles seem to have like a... Um, a, a symbolic meaning to them. Like they were a sign pointing to something greater than themselves. They were, they were never just sort of raw displays of power. I mean, it involved power, and Jesus does say, you, you could believe on me just for the sign's sake, like, you know, the fact that miracles are happening, but they weren't just displays of power. They, they were displays of power with a message and a meaning and a purpose. And all of them pointed to the fact that he was coming from the Father so that people would believe. Listen, if Jesus' goal was just to heal all sick people, he, he failed. Because after he died and rose again, there were still a lot of sick people in Israel. If it was just to go around raising the dead, well, he failed because, you know, he, he kind of only does that once or twice, depending on which ones you're counting. 
If it was to feed all of the poor in the world, well, he didn't successfully do that. I mean, he did multiply loaves and fish, and he did some of that. And, and then afterwards he said, and he, look, I am the real bread of heaven. You know, he, he does these things in compassion. He does these things in faith. But all of them are, are, are pointing back to something even bigger than that. His main mission, his main focus, where everything is flowing is this, so, so that they may believe that you have sent me. And after he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound, hand and foot, with linen strips, and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So we're just over a week away from Jesus' own death. And these miracles, these signs that Jesus has done, they've kind of been building on top of each other. And they sort of climax here, where he calls out Lazarus. And Lazarus, kind of, I mean, it's kind of, it's, you know, they put in the details, he's still wrapped in the grave clothes. I don't know if anyone's seen like zombie movies, but I kind of picture everyone's him coming out and kind of still wrapped up and, you know, everyone freaking out and running away and that, that sort of thing. Um, but Jesus says, no, don't be afraid. Go help him out. Like, help the guy out. He's wrapped up in his grave clothes. They, they had a, the Jews had a certain way of wrapping people with lots of linen and spices. And, you know, the, I can imagine it being very hard to escape by yourself out of those things. He raises it from that to show that who the master of life is, that he really is the resurrection. He, he's not a person who just teaches the resurrection, but that he is the resurrection, that he is the life. Does this outstanding miracle. And th there's two types of response to this. Like most of us are sitting here thinking, wow, if I could have seen something like that, my faith levels would have gone way up, man. I mean, just, well, maybe they would have. But it's interesting that there were two different reactions. One was... That those people who believed in Jesus, they believed in him even more. Like their faith went up. But other people who were critics, who didn't like Jesus for political reasons or social reasons, or they didn't agree with his theology, they, they witnessed this, they saw this, and it says that then they went off to plot how they could kill him. It's interesting. Miracles happen. Signs happen. There's, there's things in our world that testify to the glory of God. And you can see, you can have two different people witness the same event. You know, someone can be sick and we pray and they get better. And one person will just be like, that's just the grace of God. And other, someone else will say, oh, it's just coincidence and chance. It's not just the event. It's how people interpret them. And some people saw this as this sign, they're like, well, we don't know how Jesus did this, but this is bad news. Because if he's going around doing these signs, this is going to get us in trouble with the Romans. Right now, we're in power. We're the ones leading Israel and his popularity. He, it's a threat to us. And right now, we're the ones that are bringing peace between the Jewish people and Rome. And if we get taken out of power and they exalt this new guy, Jesus, well, as the Messiah, well, then Rome is going to come in and just... Kill us, And they had moral reasons for their rejection of Jesus. Listen, there's always moral sounding reasons to disobey and not believe Jesus. And they sound good. And these people, these religious moral leaders sat around talking about why they need to get rid of Jesus. And the high priest, it, he doesn't really mean it as a prophetic word. But it, you know, John says, well, he kind of was a prophetic word. The high priest says, well, one man should die for the good of the country. Now, in, when the high priest says this, he says it as a critic of Jesus. What he's saying is, listen, it's for the good of the country. Follow the moral reasoning. Right now, we, me, the high priest, Caiaphas, I have one foot in Rome, one foot in Israel. I, I've made peace. You know, the, the authorities in Rome, they're willing to let me lead so long as I can keep the Jewish people under control. We, we, we balance a very delicate peace between the people of Israel who want to be independent and then are overlords in Rome. You know, we, we serve an important function. And if the masses just go over this new Messiah because he does a few miracles, the Romans are going to hear about it and they're going to send their armies in and they're going to kill people and we can't have that. So it's better that he die so that other people can live. We're doing this for the greater good. 
The people who plotted to kill and murder Jesus did it because in their minds they were doing it for the greater good. They're doing it for the good of society. There's always a good moral reason for rejecting Jesus. You just, it's just not rooted in belief. He says this, but of course there's a prophetic word. You know, John, he sees this. He sees Caiaphas' comment that was meant, meant one way, and yet God intended it another. Sometimes the evil words and evil plans of men and women, you know, they, they mean one thing by it, but God's like, okay, I'll take you up on that. Jesus really will die for the sake of the nation, but not in the way that you think and not for the reasons that you think. Jesus will give his life for the nation, but not so they can have peace with Rome, but so they can have peace with God. And mild he lay his glory by, born that men no more should die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. I don't know what your biggest problem is this morning. I don't know what your challenges are. I don't know what's upset you during the week or maybe even upset you this morning. But I'm betting you're not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. This is our great hope. Jesus does this miracle, and it's a sign of the fact that he's going to rise. Now, there is a difference. Lazarus, technically, you know, I think even my Bible says the resurrection. We're used to calling this the resurrection of Lazarus. It's, it's not really the resurrection. It's maybe a more technically correct word would be a resuscitation of Lazarus or a raising him of the dead. Because Lazarus, when he came back, he came back in a normal physical body like you and I have. He probably still got colds, he probably still got flus, he probably got sick every now and then, and eventually he went on to die. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, that was a full-on resurrection where he came victorious over the powers of death with a glorified body, never to be sick, never to die again. It was a body, you know, when Jesus, the, the, the gospel accounts of when Jesus rose from the dead, I mean, he was walking through walls and floating, it's like, wow, it was like <laughs> Jesus 2.0. You know, Lazarus came back and it was the same model. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was Jesus 2.0. When Jesus calls us to, he said, when he talks about being the resurrection, he says, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Guys, this is our hope. It, we have political troubles, social troubles, health troubles, relational troubles, all these different types of things that in it is right to grieve them, it is right to mourn them, his right to be upset, lose sleep sometimes over them, to be upset. Jesus himself was upset over these things. And yet in the midst of that, he's given us a hope that's even greater than our anger, greater than our sorrows. In just a minute, we're going to have communion here. And um, this is something that Christians have celebrated for 2,000 years, uh, the bread and, and the wine. And we remember that Jesus tasted death on our behalf so that we would not have to. The reason death is in the world is because sin is in the world. And he, the good news is simply this. All of the Bible comes down to this. Jesus Christ came into the world from the Father. The Son of God came from the Father to earth. And he went to the cross. And Jesus died on the cross so that you and your sins could also be crucified with him. And then he was buried in the ground so that you and your sins could also be buried in the ground with him. And then he rose from the dead so that you and not your sins, you and not your sins could be raised from the dead one day. Because it's just not a new body we need, it's a new heart that we need. And because he died and was buried and rose again, we too... It's not just that we need to live, we need to die, we just need to die right. We need to die with Christ, so that when we die, our sins die with us. And that when we are raised from the dead, that we are raised without that sin. That we are totally new creatures in Christ Jesus. And we will live with Jesus for the glory of God forever and ever, world without end. Amen. All right. So...
This was the story of Lazarus. This is the gospel according to Lazarus right here. We're going to be, when we get back uh, next week, we're going to be talking um, about Advent a little more and then Christmas, and then we're going to get back in John chapter 12 where we continue on looking at these siblings of Mary and Martha and Lazarus in chapter 12. Uh, at this time, um, for those who are going to get ready to help us serve communion, begin to come on up, and I am going to pray. For the rest of us, I will pray at this time. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died on a cross so that our sins could be crucified with him. We thank you that he was buried in the ground so that our sins could be buried and could stay there. And we thank you for the hope of eternal life. We thank you that uh, just as... um, You rose from the dead that one day we might also rise in completely the newness of life. Amen. All right, is it clear who's distributing the bread and who's distributing? Fantastic. We can have the bread go first. For those distributing the bread, go first. And then if those distributing the wine could go after. Um, So if this is the first time you're taking communion with us, Please just take the bread and the juice and hold it in your hands. And then uh, Andrew, one of our, um, our, well, the service leader and one of our elders will be leading us in a time of reflection. And we will take the bread and the juice together at the same time. Thank you.
battle, a war between death and life. There on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. He went out to the grave, he took back every key. He rose up as a lion, now he's setting on the captive's free. There ain't no grave. So as we just prepare to take the bread and wine together, let's just reflect on what this means. I'm going to read first of all a part of what uh, the Apostle Paul has written for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we now come and take this bread, let's remember that this resurrection that we can look forward to is not free. It's not cheap. It took the death of our Lord Jesus on the cross to win that for us. Without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And this bread before us reminds us of his body, which he freely gave for us. So let's eat and remember. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, as we prepare to take this together, let's remember the cost that Jesus poured out his lifeblood literally, for us on the cross. And then that sets up, of course, for us this new covenant where we can, by his grace, enjoy eternal life with him and look forward to our own resurrection and to a body more like Jesus 2.0 than Lazarus 1.0. Let's drink and remember. Lord Jesus, words cannot express how we feel about all that you have done for us. The incarnation that we thought of in our prayers earlier, the crucifixion that we've remembered now, and the resurrection that we have thought ahead to too. This is a deep and marvellous story, and we pray that it would indeed be at the forefront of our minds, that as we regularly take these elements together and remember you and proclaim your death, that you would become real or more real to us in our daily lives and that we would indeed look forward to your coming again and to the glorious future that we can have with you in heaven. 
Until then, Father, we pray that you would part us with your blessing, that you would uh, be with each one who wasn't able to gather this morning, but maybe is joining online, and help us together to know the joy of Christ with us, to know the joy of Emmanuel at this season of Advent. Amen. So that brings our service to an end. We'll say the words of a grace together in a moment, just to remind you that uh, while you're most welcome to stay and to have fellowship, please do so outside. Uh, I don't think, maybe it is raining, but uh, we've all got coats uh, and we live in Britain. Uh, so there's space outside at the side, obviously over the road in the car park, probably not in the middle of the road. But if you can please make your way out uh, promptly, that would be good. But let's just end our service by saying the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. <laughs>